So Bob, can you talk to me about the history of Robert Talbot being this iconic American brand? It's a pretty simple story really. Robert Talbot was founded by Robert Talbot and his wife Audrey. Um, she had a pension for making bow ties. And he, what year was this? It was back in 1950. He was uh -huh. working on Wall Street at the time and they decided to follow their life's passion and um, revisited the place of their honeymoon, Carmel, California, uh, on a trip from New York, decided to make, make that their new homestead and started the business there making bow ties and neckties. At the time, was there a lot of American manufacturing in the, in the men's apparel business? Well, I would say probably <laughs> not, uh, right. but I would say it was the beginning of American manufacturing for shifting from manufacturing for wartime to manufacturing for rebuilding of the economy after the war, and I would say his timing was absolutely perfect for that. Well, over the, over the following 36 years in Monterey, uh, on the Monterey Peninsula, starting in Carmel and moving into Monterey, he moved from basically a garage business into setting up a factory and growing that up, up to a full 75,000 square foot facility with 120 odd employees at the time. And, and built it to a full neckwear business and men's shirting business as well. Why another luxury shirt? What was so special about the Robert Talbot shirt? I would say that um, the details, it was a luxury, it was a luxury item as opposed to, it, made in America as opposed to made somewhere, somewhere else around the world. Mm -hmm. Things like mother of pearl buttons, French roll seams, uh, really, really exotic and expensive fabrics from Italy and in England, um, mm -hmm. and really took what was a, was was a European craft, craftsmanship oriented shirt and made it in the U.S. Can we talk about you coming into the business? I took over the business, and um, as you said, about two and a half years ago now, July 2011, um, the son of uh, Mr. Talbot asked me to join the company and basically run the run the apparel business for them. Um, we also have a winery, and uh, the son spends the majority of his time on the wine, uh, all of his time essentially on a the wine. beautiful winery. Wine, wine business, yeah. Uh -huh. It is a terrific and very, 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 very good wine as well. And uh, I've been there now for about two and a half years, and I found a business that had sort of um, had its, had, had reached its high watermark, probably in the mid 80s, mid, mid, and mid 90s, and it, at that time sort of stalled. Uh -huh. So I found a business that still had core competency in, in ties in bow ties uh, and in shirtings. Mm -hmm. But the market was uh, literally over, is literally overcrowded with great suppliers from all around the world. So it's not enough anymore just to make really super product because everybody makes really good product. Right. So we needed to define a little bit more about the brand. It was a manufacturing company mm -hmm. that was filling a need historically, a growing need. And we made a decision to transition it into a brand and start to expand the assortment uh, judiciously over the last couple of years and now we're pretty much a full collection of menswear. Um, Robert Talbert, a company that's built on bow ties, you'll speak with a lot of guys even though there's a small resurgence of men wearing bow ties, a lot of men will say I don't like a bow tie, I will never wear a bow tie. What do you have to say about that? You know, I, I was one of those guys. I mean a bow tie to me was, I was going to, I was going to school when I was, as, a little, as, as a little guy and I had to wear a bow tie, right? Mm -hmm or my parents would, my mother would put a bow tie on me. Well, you know what, it, I had the same feeling. Uh, but I will tell you, it's whimsical, it's fun, it looks pretty good. A nice bow tie is a nice bow tie, regardless, <laughs> and it makes a statement. Right. And some people wear it to make a, make, make, a, make a statement. Can you tell me a little bit about the current spring 2014 line? It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> But can you uh, tell me, is there color patterns? Do you, are, are you gearing towards, who is this Robert Talbot man? What is he looking for? And the Robert Talbot man historically has been the 55 year old gentleman. Um, mm -hmm. Again, affluent, well-dressed, has an appreciation for quality and likes a little bit more color than what a traditional But are we uh, saying a 55 year old attorney or a 55 year old creative director? Yes and yes, <laughs> right? We have enough in the line to appeal to both, right? right. Even an attorney that's got a creative bent in him, right? <laughs> so. But we've moved that down now to 45, because I mean, being a guy that's no longer, no longer 55 even, I want to be 45 <laughs> too. So the clothing has gotten more shaped, more tailored, uh, more color. We haven't moved away from our traditional cut in our, in our traditional um, business. Sarah, Correct. where do you see the future of Robert Talbert? And I'd like to, I, we're very committed to the specialty store in America. As you know from your own experience, there used to be many, many, many more of these specialty stores in America. And they went through a pretty tough time in the, in, the two th in, the, in the first part of this century. We think they've reached the nadir of their existence, as it were, and we think we see a, we see a good rebound. They're meaningful. 
they carry brands and they have a consumer proposition for the local market that is very difficult for mm -hmm. a large operation to, to, to copy, really. Mm -hmm. And we're very committed to them. So I see us growing more within those doors and some other doors as well. Where do you see the future of fashion with, um, with the onset of transmedia platforms, the internet? Look, I think the world has changed. I mean, clearly it has changed. Definitely. We live in a 360 degree universe now where you're being pushed and pulled and provoked and prodded and, and inspired and, and, and communicated to, both on a push-pull basis where you're pulling information and information is being pushed so to you. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's an excellent thing because okay. at the end of the day, one of the, great, one of the great things in life that we have as humans is choice. And I'm up for the competition. I want there to be choice. I want the consumer to look at our product and look at somebody else's product and, and decide if the value proposition, the look, the feel. The feel you can't get quite get there yet, but the look and mm -hmm. the value proposition, it, we think tips in our favor. That's number one. Number, number two, I absolutely believe that shopping and purchasing is still a social, emotional, and tactile experience. Yes. 20 years ago, it was unthinkable that you would go onto the internet and order five pair of shoes and send them to your house and send four of them back and keep one. That's happening now in just about all, all of our products. Because look, people are, we're yeah. here on the ninth floor on beautiful Fifth Avenue in New York in our showroom and we have customers come up to see us here as well because people still want to feel the product. They want that tactile experience.